Chapter 17 of Danger in Deep Space. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Danger in Deep Space by Kerry Rockwell. Narrated by Sam Holloway. Chapter 17. The subdued whine of the hyperdrive filled the power deck and made Roger wince as he stepped through the hatch and waved at Astro. He climbed down the ladder and stopped beside the big Venusian, who stood stripped to the waist, watching the pressure gauges on the power deck control board. Hi, Roger, said Astro with a big grin. Hello, Astro, replied Roger and sat down on a stool nearby. Excuse me a minute, hotshot, said Astro. Got to check the baffling around reaction tube three. The big cadet hurriedly donned a lead-lined protective suit and entered the reaction chamber. After a moment, he reappeared and took off the suit. He poured a glass of water, handed it to Roger, and poured another for himself. Gets pretty hot down here, he said. I don't like to use the air conditioner when I'm on hyperdrive. Sucks my power output and reduces pressure on the oxygen pumps. Roger nodded absently at the needlessly detailed explanation. Astro looked at him sharply. Say, what's eating you? Honestly, Astro, said Roger, I've never felt more miserable in my life. Don't let it get you down, Roger, said Astro. The Major said it was a mistake anyone could make. Yeah, flared Roger. But have you seen the way he just talks? Talks? asked Astro blankly. Yeah, talks, said Roger. No yelling, or blasting off, or handing out demerits like they were candy. Nothing. Why, he hasn't even chewed Alfie out since we left Junior. He just sits in his quarters. Astro understood now and nodded his head in agreement. Yeah, you're right. I'd rather have him fusing his tubes in the way he is now. Tom must feel pretty rotten too, said Roger. I haven't seen much of him either. Or Alfie, put in Astro. Neither of them have done anything but work. I don't think either of them has slept since we left Tara. It's all my fault, said Roger. I'm nothing but a loudmouthed bag of space gas with an asteroid for a head. He got up and lurched toward the ladder. Hey, where are you going? yelled Astro. Almost forgot, yelled Roger from the top of the ladder. I've got to feed our prisoners a meal, and the way I feel, I'd like to shove it down their throats. Roger went directly to the galley off the control deck and prepared a hasty meal for Loring and Mason. He piled it on a tray and went below to the brig. All right, Loring, he growled. Come and get it. Well, 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 sneered Loring. Where's the big manning spirit? You boys are kind of down since you blew that little operation, ah. Listen, you space crawler, said Manning coldly. One more word out of you, and I'll bring you out in the passageway and pound that head of yours into space junk. I wish you'd try that, you little squirt, snarled Loring. I'd break you in two. OK, pal, said Roger. I'm going to give you that chance. He opened the door to the cell and Loring stepped out. Holding the Paralo ray gun on him, Roger relocked the door. Left inside, Mason stuck his face close to the grill. Give it to him, Loring, he hissed. Take him apart! Roger threw the Paralo ray gun in the corner of the passageway and faced the heavier spaceman. He held his arms loosely at his side, and he balanced on the balls of his feet. A slight smile played at the corners of his mouth. Stop breaking, Loring, he said quietly. Why, you... snarled Loring and rushed in. He swung wildly for Roger's head, but the cadet slipped inside the punch and drove a hard right to Loring's midsection. The prisoner doubled over, staggered back, and slowly straightened up. Roger's lips were drawn tightly in a grimace of cold anger. His eyes were shining hard and bright. He stepped in quickly and chopped two straight lefts to Loring's jaw, then doubled the spaceman up again with a hard right to the heart. Loring gasped and tried to clinch but Roger threw a straight, jolting right to his jaw. The prisoner slumped to the floor, out cold. The fight was finished. Roger went over, picked up the Paralo ray gun, and opened the cell door again. All right, Mason, he said coldly. Drag him inside. And if you want to try me for size, just say so. Mason didn't answer. He merely hurried out, and grabbing Loring by the feet, dragged him inside. Roger slammed the door and locked it. Rubbing his knuckles and feeling better than he had felt for days, he started back to the radar bridge. As he neared Major Kong's quarters, he heard Connell's voice. He stopped and listened outside the door. It's a beautiful job of calculation, Tom, 
O'Connell was saying. I don't see how you and Higgins could have done it in so short a time. And without an electronic computer to aid you. Beautiful job. Really excellent. But I'm afraid it's too risky. Well, I've already talked to Astro and Mr. Shinny, sir, said Tom, and they've volunteered. I haven't spoken to Roger yet, but I'm sure he'd be willing to try. Roger stepped through the door. Whatever it is, said Roger, I'm ready. Eavesdropping on your commanding officer, said Connell, eyeing the blonde-headed cadet speculatively, is a very serious offence. I just happened to hear my name mentioned, sir, replied Roger with a smile. Connell turned back to Tom. Go over that again, Tom. Well, sir, said Tom, Junior's falling into the sun at a speed of 22 miles a second right now, but we could still land a jet boat on Junior, set up more nuclear explosions to blast him out of the sun's grip, and send him on his way to our solar system. We wouldn't get as much speed as before, but we'd still save the copper. By this time, Astro and Shinny had joined the group and were standing outside the door in the passageway, listening silently. Connell tugged at his chin. Let's see, he said. If we could get back to Tar in three days... He looked up at Astro. Do you think you could get us back in three days, Astro? Major Connell, for another crack of genius, roared the big Venusian. I'd get you back in a day and a half. All right, said Connell. That's one problem. But there are others. What, sir? asked Tom. We have to prepare reactant fuses, and we have to build new reactor units. If we could do that... If Astro can get us back, said Shinny, and Roger and this smart young fellow here, Alfie, can make up some fuses, I'll build them their units. After all, Astro showed me how once. I guess I can follow his orders. Good, said Connell. Now there's the element of time. How much time would we need on Junior? He looked at Tom. Let me answer this way, sir, said Tom. We'd only have two hours to plant the reaction charges and trigger them, but that should be enough. Why so close, Tom? asked Roger. It has to be, answered Tom. We know what the pull of the sun is and the power of the jet boat. When the sun's pull becomes greater than the escape speed of the jet boat, the boat would never clear. It would keep falling into the sun. I based this figure on reaching Junior at the last possible moment. It'd take at least five men to set up the five explosions we need, mused Connell. That means one of us will have to stay on the Polaris. There was an immediate and loud chorus of Not me, me. from everyone. All right, said Connell. We'll draw numbers. One, two, three, four, five, and six. The man who draws number six will stay with the Polaris. All right? Yes, sir, said Tom, glancing around. We agree to that. Connell went to his desk and wrote quickly on six slips of paper. He folded each one, dumped them in his cap, and offered it to Astro. All right, Astro, said Connell. Draw. Astro licked his lips and stuck in his big paw. The Venusian fingered several, then pulled out a slip of paper. He opened it and read aloud. Number two, I go. He turned and grinned at the others. Connell offered his cap to Alfie. Alfie dipped in two fingers and pulled out a slip. Number four, I go. He squealed. Roger and Shinny drew numbers one and three. Tom looked at the Major. Go ahead, Corbett, said Connell. After you, sir, said Tom. I said draw one, roared Connell. Yes, sir, said Tom. He reached in and quickly pulled out one of the two remaining slips. Number six, he said quietly. I stay. Connell, not bothering to open the last one, slapped the hat on his head and turned away. But, sir, said Tom, I, uh... Connell cut him off with a wave of his hands. No buts, he turned to the others. Manning, Higgins, get me a course back to Junior and make it clean and straight. Astro, Shinny, stand by on the power deck for course change. Tom, get on the control deck. We're going back to snatch a hot copper filling right out of a sun's teeth. Once again, the energy of the six spacemen was burned in 24-hour stretches of improvisation and detailed calculations. Roger and Alfie redesigned the fuse to ensure perfect coordination of the explosions. Astro and Shinny surpassed their previous efforts by putting enough power in the five small reaction units to more than do the job required. Tom, standing long watches on the control deck, devoted his spare time to the tortuous equations that would mean failure or success to the whole project. And Major Connell, alert and alive once more, drove his crew toward greater goals than it had achieved before. Nearly three days later, the Polaris appeared over the twin oceans of Tara and glided into an orbit just beyond the pull of the planet's gravity. 
Aboard the spaceship, last-minute preparations were made by the red-eyed spaceman. In constant contact with Space Academy, using the resources of the Academy's scientific staff to check the more difficult calculations, the six men on the Polaris worked on. Connell appeared on the radar bridge and flipped on the long-range scanner. I have to find out where Junior is, he said to Roger and Alfie. That doesn't work, sir, said Roger. What do you mean it doesn't work? exploded Connell. Junior's falling into the sun, sir. The radiations are blocking it out from our present position. Couldn't we move to another position? asked the officer. Yes, sir, said Roger. We could, but to do that would take extra time and we haven't got it. Then how are you going to find Junior? asked Connell. Alfie's busy with a special scanner, sir, one that's especially sensitive to copper. Since the sun is composed mostly of gas, with this filter only Junior will show up on the screen. By the rings of Saturn! exclaimed Connell. You mean to tell me that Alfie Higgins is building a new radar scanner? Just like that? Why, yes, sir, answered Roger innocently. Is there something wrong with that? No, no, said Connell, backing off the bridge. Just, just go right on. You're doing fine. Yes, sir, fine. He literally ran from the bridge. Most humorous of you, Manning, said Alfie, smiling. I'll tell you something funnier than that, said Roger. I feel the same way he does. Is there anything you can't do, Alfie? Alfie thought for a moment. Yes, there is, he said at last. What? demanded Roger. I can't, shall I say, make as much progress as you do with the uh, space dolls. Roger's draw dropped. Space dolls? You mean girls? Alfie nodded his head. Listen, said Roger. When we get Junior on his way home and we get back to the Academy, I promise you I'll show you how to really blast your jets with the space lovelies in Atom City. Alfie put out his hand seriously. And if you do that for me, Roger, I'll show you how to use the new electronic brain they recently acquired in the Academy. Only one other person can operate it, but you definitely have the potential. Roger stared at him stupidly. Huh? Yeah. Oh, sure. Gradually, the mass of data was brought together and coordinated, and finally, as Tom stood beside him, Major Connell checked over his calculations. I can't see a thing wrong with it, Tom, Connell said at last. I guess that's it. Figuring we land on Junior at exactly uh, 1,700 hours, we'd reach the point of no return exactly two hours later. Shall I alert stations to blast off for Junior? asked Tom. Yes, said Connell. Bring the Polaris to dead ship in space about 300 miles above Junior. And that's when we'll blast off in jet boats. Yes, sir, said Tom. His eyes bright, he turned to the intercom. All right, you space babies, he announced. This is it. Stand by to blast Junior. Here we come. End of chapter 17